You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Brad. I was wondering if you have time to answer some of my questions about my upcoming test. Sure, no problem, Jeff. What is it that you're having problems on? Well, it's for my English final. We have to prepare a five-minute speech to present in front of the whole class, including the professor, so I'm a little bit worried. Is there any specific topic, or can you do it on whatever you want? It has to have something to do with the origins of English literature. I'm thinking of doing it on Shakespeare, but I bet many other students will have the same idea. That's fine. Don't worry if others are doing the same thing. As long as you do a good job, that's all that counts. A good professor will grade all students fairly. You really think so? I suppose Shakespeare is the most famous author, so it should be fine. Besides, Shakespeare has so many works. You only have to choose a couple of them and talk about those. I guess you're right. Do you have any advice about how to prepare a speech? First, you need to select your topic. Have you done this yet? Yes, I have lots of information on Shakespeare. Good. Next, you should do a research on a specific topic. Do you have a deadline for which to turn in your speech topic? The deadline is next Tuesday. So you should have a detailed outline of what you will say by then. Do not just turn in a piece of paper saying Shakespeare on it. That will not give your professor any idea as to what you will be talking about. OK. So you think I should write out an outline of my speech? Of course! Writing your speech out in outline form is essential. No one could give a speech from scratch. Even the president must refer to his outline when giving a speech. An outline will give you a good structure to base your speech on. Now look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 26 to 30. That's true. I was thinking that I would do an outline last after I figured everything out, but I think your idea is better. What should I do after I have an outline prepared? You should then write the speech out, word for word, what you're going to say. This is so you'll have a firm idea of what you will say. It doesn't mean that the speech you will give will be exactly the same, but at least you have a fairly good idea what the final product will be. At this point, I can read it over for you if you want. Really? That would be great. I would appreciate that so much. No problem. Once you write it out, the next step is to practice giving the speech. At first, you can do it in front of the mirror, so you can see your expressions and your presentation. After that, you should practice giving your speech to some friends. I can listen to it for you too. That's a great idea. I really owe you a big favour then. Sure. You can do my Latin homework for me. Just kidding. Seriously, don't worry about it. I can help you with anything you need. So when is the speech due? Well, the speech topic is due next Tuesday. The speech itself will be due next Friday. I can help you any time you want because I have no tests this next week. Besides, I'm an English major and Shakespeare is one of my favourite authors, so helping you out will be no big deal. Thanks so much. Well... I'm going to the library to get started on all this. I'll call you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, then. This is the end of Section 3. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college you find yourself saying things like I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem. It's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people. But artists also have to bear their souls to the world in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork. And without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways. And I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition. The one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. There are a few of these competitions each year and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. Perhaps I was lucky in that I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't, you'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case, I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. 
it is then easier to analyze the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognized in anything other than the pigeonholes that they have been placed in. Luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. This is the end of section four. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Please subscribe to my Pilot Tips channel.